Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Zach Eilon as uh, today's, uh, well, the twice weekly speaker of our, of our seminar series. Uh, Zach is joining us from uh, Le Mans Doherty. Uh, he got his uh, PhD for his uh, bachelor's and master's uh, at the University of Cambridge in 2010. Uh, in Europe, they do this very civilized thing where they give you two degrees all at once for free. Uh, I got the same thing. It's great. Um, and uh, he's been at Le Mans Doherty since. What did you do a year at Harvard? Yeah. One year at Harvard, uh, since it's Lamont Doherty, where he's going to be working principally with Jeff Abers. Uh, a whole bunch of his PhD work he's going to be talking about today, uh, which is on the Woodlark Basin, uh, which is a basin of interest. It's a place where the continental crust is breaking up very rapidly, uh, therefore a great place to look at uh, the processes that lead to continental evolution. Uh, he's also been working on the convergence side of things by uh, looking at the oceanic lithosphere, uh, particularly at the, the thermal uh, structure of the Juan de Fuca plate as it's conducting below uh, North America. Um, Zach is finishing up his PhD, and we very much hope that he will make the decision to come join us for a year or two uh, as a postdoc in, uh, in our department. Uh, and with that, let's welcome Zach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for that very well informed uh, introduction. Um, Actually, what they didn't tell you is that if you stay alive and out of prison for another three years, they give you another master's afterwards. Oh. I, think, I think you have to pay £50 or something, but it's, it's to a great inflation. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know that there's already a weekly seminar uh, coming up, so I'm um, pleased that you've made time to come and listen to me. Uh, so first of all, I need to acknowledge my advisor, uh, Jeff Abers, and uh, members of the committee and other grad students that have worked on this with me, Jim Garrity. Uh, Jingle and Roger Buck. And as Peter said, I'm going to be showing you some uh, some new results and some um, published for a couple of years now from the Woodlock Rift, which is this really interesting area of Papua New Guinea where this very young continent is being actively broken up. Um, and some of the things that we would like to know, some of the things motivating this uh, study are, um, what can this particular rift tell us about the process of the breakup of the continent? Um, in terms of the, the mantle structure that's established uh, adjacent to a, a spreading center that's propagating into a continent. This rift, as you may know, plays host to the world's youngest ultra-high pressure rocks, and can our images tell us something about their genesis? Uh, and then, so this is going to comprise an isotropic tomography study, and then I also did some show splitting that shows that this area has plenty of anisotropy. So can we improve on traditional iso isotropic tomography? Um, and the answer is yes, we can. Uh, and we will see that the anisotropy within this rift is rather is um, is actually very similar to some ridges, but many rifts don't display uh, this particular um, phenomenon. So, continental rifts are uh, areas that have been studied significantly. That we have a lot of data from these areas, and they're important because they are um, the locations where one of the fundamental processes of processes of plate tectonics occurs. And something that we often observe is that we have this kind of thinning of the crust. But for example, this is uh, from the main Ethiopian rift. Um, you can tell from this receiver <coughs> function image that while the, the crust has been thinned along the axis of the rift, it's not entirely gone. In fact, it's not really anywhere near gone. We still have 30 kilometers of crust, despite the fact that teleseismic tomography images show really low velocities in the mantle underlying this, underlying this rift. And so they're so low that they sort of indicate uh, lithospheric removal, at least the lithosphere that we think of as seismologists. Um, and so this is obviously one extremely well-studied uh, region, but we look to other continental rifts to try and get at the multitude of really important processes that are at work um, during the extension and facilitating the extension. This is, a, this is an amazing drawing by Ben Holtzman. I sort of refer to this as his, like his personal brain's 3D tomography of all the possible incredibly complicated processes that could be occurring, things like infiltration and impounding of dikes from the bottom, as well as uh, important uh, large faults at the surface. So let's uh, go to our field area. The Woodlock Rift lies between uh, the Australian Plate and Pacific Plate up to the northeast. And it's actually in this zone of broad oblique convergence. The two plates are obliquely colliding at 110 millimeters a year, which includes 70 millimeters a year of shortening across this zone. And this deformation is accommodated by this series of microplates, uh, actually extending uh, quite a way to the northwest of this area. 
Um, but the kind of proximal environment right here is extensional, driven by subduction of the Solomon Sea Plate of the St. Christopher and New Britain trenches, which is opening up this rift to, to the south between the Solomon Sea and stable Australia. Um, the extension began about 8 million years ago, and seafloor spreading initiated in the far east of this region about 6 million years ago, and since then has propagated more than 500 kilometers westwards into the continent. And the region that we're going to be studying uh, is this region of highly thin continent just to the west of the youngest propagating spreading center, where the continent has undergone significant thinning, but not yet quite broken up. Um, one of the particularly interesting features of this rift is that it has these islands, um, and th there's also this example here, which are, co which are cored by metamorphic core complexes that expose ultra-high pressure uh, rocks at the surface. Most of these are high-pressure um, eclogites um, and quartzofeldspathic gneisses, uh, and there is this one locality with an ultra-high pressure sample. So we uh, put out this array of broadband seismometers, including eight ocean bottom seismometer stations to image this region of highly rifted continent. And as I mentioned, um, there in 2004, this uh, sample of ultra high pressure cursi eclogite was identified at one of the uh, islands within this rift, which was exhumed from depths of around 100 kilometers and temperatures around 700 degrees uh, in as little as 5 million years. So these are the world's youngest UHP rocks. Um, and these were exhumed um, at the same time as this rift was undergoing between 70 and 100 kilometers of extension. And there's presumably some link between the extensional processes and the process processes that allowed the uplift of these ultra-high pressure rocks. And this extension, like I mentioned, is just a long strike from the youngest spreading centers. Now, I should just mention that these two values are actually um, lower bounds of the amounts of extension. Um, we have magnetic seafloor anomalies uh, to the east of this area that go back six million years. And these uh, estimates are from only three and a half million years where we have symmetric magnetic isochrons. Um, but it's likely that actually this uh, area has seen as much as two times the values that I'm showing here. But still, this is a significant extension uh, within this region of, uh, of the rift that also plays host to these MCCs. Was now, that, yeah? Can you see where the uh, continent ocean boundary is there? <laughs> Um, you really cannot see very well. So as you, just off to the immediate east of this region, you sort of get into this area where you have the Morris B. Seamount and other bathymetric features that are somewhere between these, looking like these islands and looking like something that begins to approach the sort of very clear morphology of a mid-ocean ridge. Right? So these spreading centers are much more, look different from things that you see anywhere else, except perhaps some of the examples of like, the Megamullions on at the corners and transforms in the Atlantic. But, uh, so these are a little bit more anomalous, but these look like very clear um, sort of oceanic crust. Oops. So one other interesting feature here is that just to the north of this region is um, a bathymetric low adjacent to a large bathymetric high uh, that looks sort of like a flexural high that we might see at several subduction zones. Um, and it's been suggested that this boundary, called the Trobriand Trough, um, was host to subduction as recently as the late Miocene. Uh, that's required by some plate tectonic reconstructions, but there's no seismicity on there today. And uh, there's no really good evidence that, uh, um, tomographically, for any sorts of features that could be associated with subduction until now. And we'll come back to that. Um, but the, the history of subduction is perhaps evident in some of the geochemistry. Um, so for example, you can see this Niobian tantalum trough. So from, um, these are from lavas on um, Good Enough Island and some out on the mainland here. Um, they also have this uh, Barium lanthanum and lanthanum samarium enrichment. You can see that the lavas are wet. They have as much as three, three and a half weight percent water, which uh, according to Philip Ruprecht implies uh, up to 3,000 ppm water in the source. So these look very much like they are subduction enriched, but then we have other chemical traces that indicate that these things kind of look like any other morph. Right? The, um, the water serum ratios, water potassium ratios, uh, fall within the field that, not the, not the uh, array that's expected or observed for other arcs, but the region that's 
um, associated with more. So one of the interpretations of this is that this is a region that has had a source that's been enriched by recent subduction, but which now is much more like a mid-ocean ridge. So the analysis that I've done, um, first of all, concerns um, teleseismic tomography using PNS body waves. So we take arrivals of body waves from teleseismic earthquakes uh, recorded across the array. We filter them and align them using cross-correlation. Um, and then from that, from the relative um, travel times between them, we get differential travel times that relate to velocity heterogeneities in the shallow, uh, in the shallow Earth. And we sort of keep track of the center frequency of these, free, of these uh, filter bands for a finite frequency uh, kernel inversion. And we keep track of things like how, how well these match each other, the maximum of the cross-correlation to weight them in the inversion later. So we do that for all the events across, um, across our array. And we come up with uh, these maps where the differential travel times are projected according to their back azimuth at each station. Uh, and they're colored by travel time where the red colors indicate uh, travel time delays, i.e. Um, the body waves have passed through slower material. And a couple of things immediately jump out. There's this east-west swath in the center of the array, which has predominantly positive, i.e. delayed late travel times, um, which in indicates slow structure. And you can also see that several stations at the margins of this region, for example, the northern coast of, coast of Goodenough here, uh, show large back azimuthal variations in travel times. And this is a pretty robust indicator that you have large, shallow mantle velocity heterogeneities. So like I said, we plug this into a finite frequency inversion, um, and we sort of turn all the knobs that you do, and we do our resolution tests and our checkerboard tests and all the things that tomographers do. Um, and this is what we get at. So these are different um, horizontal velocity slices through our model. This is the P-wave model, VP. Uh, I've contoured it here by a measure of called hit quality, which essentially uh, tells me how well each voxel is illuminated. And it correlates with things like the, um, the checkerboard semblance and, um, and bootstrapped uncertainties, which we also sort of, we go through all these things just to uh, get, a, get a sense that this area, which I've not masked here, is really, ro we are really robustly imaging the, uh, the structure in this area. So we kind of trust it. And so what we see very clearly is along the center of this region, um, an extremely low velocity region in the upper mantle, right, from 60 kilometers down to 180. Uh, you can see something deeper than that, but we did squeezing tests that indicate that we, our data can't actually um, require velocity heterogeneities deeper than this depth. So that's there, but you shouldn't pay too much attention to it. So that's the first order uh, signal. The other thing you, you'll notice is that to the north of this, there's this uh, blue region, which uh, means uh, there's some high velocity structure um, on the northern margin of this rift. Now, if we look at the um, shear velocities, it's largely the same. A uh, couple of differences with the VP is that the, um, the shear velocity is directly beneath this basin between the Castillo Islands and the Papuan Peninsula uh, are particularly low and a little broader. And there's also not much of a, um, there's not as clear a southern flank to the uh, rift. And I'll try and get into that at the end a little bit if I have time. But you can still see this extremely high velocity anomaly to the north of this rift. So if we overlay these um, velocities onto things that people other than seismologists care about, such as volcanoes and uh, seismicity, which I guess is still what we care about, um, and things like the, the heat flow, um, you can see that the locus of this rift, this very narrow, fairly well localized east-west rift, aligns precisely with this linear trend of volcanoes with a linear trend of seismicity, with the lowest heat flow, with the thinnest crust, I'll show you in a second, and is directly along strike from the seafloor spreading centers. Right, so this is the very clear signature of this rift propagating due uh, west from the spreading centers. And this is kind of interesting, because as I'll show you in a second, the crust hasn't actually thinned that much. So it seems like the rift is beginning to organize itself in the mantle from 60 down to even 125 and deeper depths before the surface is completely broken up. Now there's been, what, 70 to 100 kilometers of extension of the surface, so you know there are good reasons, or there are clear ways that the surface and the, and the mantle are talking to each other, but um, what we're arguing for here is that 250 kilometers um, westward of the nearest seafloor spreading centers, you've organized the mantle into um, something that is basically looking like a mid-ocean ridge. 
Now, like I said, the takeaway is that the localized mantle rift signature precedes the um, ridge development of the surface. Uh, so the kind of eagle-eyed among you would have noticed there are a few of these earthquake dots uh, in magenta. So these are the, um, I should say, this seismicity catalog comes from PICs done by an intern um, at Le Mans and were relocated using double difference techniques. Uh, and these here are the first intermediate depth earthquakes that have been well uh, located in this region. They're all located at more than 10 stations and have an OBS station above them within 40 kilometers. So these are really, these are not significantly mislocated in depth. And they fall right within this extremely fast velocity region in our models. Right? So this seems um, like it has to be not only relatively fast, which is what the teleseismic tomography is telling us, that's what the colors are telling us, this has to be absolutely um, cold right, in order to be seismogenic. It probably has to be maximum 700 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, and so we have this fairly localized and narrow rift signature going down to some depth. Uh, juxtaposed against this cold structure just to the north. And as we'll see in a sec, that's, that explains the extremely large peak-to-peak uh, -peak velocity heterogeneities. Um, so this is the first evidence that there's actually some sort of a lithospheric fra fragment, likely a slab, although it could be something more exotic, like a lithospheric drip associated with, uh, with the rapid extension. Um, and it contains this intermediate depth seismicity. And just stepping from this cross-section, we're going to go a little bit to the east. And you can see that going between the two, the rift signature has got, um, has got slower and it's got slightly broader. So as we, prove, as we go from, east, uh, from west to east towards the increased extension, uh, as we expect, the rift is getting uh, sort of more profound. And if I just do a, an east-west cross-section, you can see that signature clearly, where progressing towards increasing extension, the region of low velocity is getting deeper and stronger. Um, coherent with thin, increasing thinning of the crust. This is actual MOVO surface taken from receiver functions. So, um, like I said, we seismologists like to make patterns of high and low velocities. Everyone else would like to know what's actually physically going on. So one of the ways we can get at this is by comparing um, the shear velocity variations and the compressional velocity variations. Because the way that they co-vary tells you something about the physical processes. Um, you can think of it, it's, it essentially comes about from different physical processes have different um, relative effects on the shear modulus and the bulk modulus, right? So low, so if we plot arrays of points and we look at, so for a given place in the earth, what is its shear velocity variation and, and compression velocity variation, if, it's, if the uh, points within the earth fall along an array that has a low gradient, then we can attribute that largely to temperature control. Uh, and if it's a steep gradient, then the control uh, may require something that particularly suppresses the shear modulus, likely melt or water. Right, so we're going to do this for all the points within our array, um, so within our velocity models. And you can see that in bulk, they plot with this trend that has a gradient of 1.58, which is squarely within the temperature field. Right? Temperature you expect somewhere between 1.2 and 2 as a maximum. Right? So this lies right in the middle of what we expect from a purely thermal control. Um, and we can separate that between the deep parts of the model and the shallow parts of the model, and there's really no difference. I mean, there's a bit more scatter in the shallow parts of the model. Perhaps the only place that you can say that, oh, these are really unusually low shear velocities is these points that I've indicated by triangles, and these are right underneath the volcanoes in the very shallowmost part of the, of the mantle. So, you know, perhaps there is a, a slight uh, influence of melt on these velocities in the top, you know, 50, 60 kilometers right underneath the volcanoes, but everywhere else, this array... Um, these models seem to indicate that temperature is playing the important role. Now, that, that's fine, you may say, but what I'm showing you here is something with a peak-to-peak -peak, um, velocity heterogeneity of, in VP of almost 7%, uh, which is enormous. If you've ever looked at these images for a rift, you'll know that sort of the most seen in really anywhere else is 3%, and it's more than double that. So is that actually believable? So what I do is um, I take a... Let's say we have a mantle potential temperature of uh, 1250 and some adiabat, and then we'll calculate the temperatures at 95 kilometers, um, and we'll assume a, ver a variety of grain sizes, and we'll put in um, anharmonic uh, velocities from a model like Hephaesto. And then we'll calculate at different temperatures, stepping away from the adiabat, um, what the predicted velocities would be. 
and will apply the um, relationships of Jackson and Fowl to in include anelasticity, and then predict what the thermal control alone on shear velocity and p-velocity would be. And you can see that when we do this, we find that for a reasonable sort of grain size of maybe a centimeter, you're actually able to get the full range of um, velocity variation from thermal variations on the order of 700 degrees. Now that seems like a lot, but remember that we have something like adiabatic temperatures in here is what we're arguing for, juxtaposed against a, a, a slab, which we know from the seismicity has to be around 600 degrees. So this pretty much gets us exactly what we, what we need to, what we expect from the velocities. Oops. So um, what we get away from this is that we actually have unusually good, between the tomography models and the seismicity allied with those tomography models, we have really unusually good constraints on the actual pressure and temperature within this rift. It looks like this could be directly along an adiabat, and this could be sort of the upper boundary of how, uh, how hot something can be and still, be, uh, still contain seismicity. Um, and the fact that this is along an adiabat means that within the axis of the rift itself, um, you've pretty much removed the lithosphere, right? At least, um, at least seismically. It means that the, the temperatures within the axis of the rift are around 1300 degrees, and the lithosphere is gone. So we'll hopefully get into that in a sec. But there's one other really intriguing thing that we get out of this. Because we've managed to really quite accurately pin down the PT conditions of this blue blob, as we affectionately call it, uh, and we've pinned them down to be at around 100 kilometers depth and around six or 700 degrees Celsius. Those are, uh, those are precisely the peak um, high pressure conditions recorded in the Kursai Ekvajai sample uh, that got us so excited about the rift in the first place. So there's a possibility, if I just hand back, um, that, these, that this um, blue blob, which is, lies just a long strike from those uh, metamorphic core complexes within which we see the high, the high pressure rocks, there's a possibility this is a potential future uh, source region of high pressure rocks, or simply a remnant of um, a previous source that has been exposed in some places, and this has kind of just been left down there. There's a less um, exciting possibility, which is just that the, this is basically a coincidence, and this is a description of the fact that the geotherm worldwide is roughly the same. And so if you go down to a given pressure and temperature along an adiabat, then you find the same conditions basically everywhere. So if, if that's all that this is telling us, then it's less exciting. But given the kind of the, um, the proximity uh, and the potential dynamic connections between them, it's kind of an interesting observation uh, that at least modelers can take forward. So one thing which I mentioned um, was that um, we're interested in how lithosphere and crust uh, fit in comparison to each other within rifts. Um, so as we've just seen, the lithosphere at really shallow depth within this rift is basically gone, despite the fact that our receiver function um, data tell us that we have 25 kilometers of crust left, right, compared to about 35 maybe on the axes of the rift. So the crust is thin by a factor of a third, and the lithosphere is pretty much gone. And this is something that has been argued for in the main Ethiopian rift as well. Um, and what it probably requires is either lower crustal flow to sort of uh, quote unquote artificially thicken the crust within the center of this rift in this because uh, you've had sufficient time for crust on the margins to flow uh, into the middle, or it's because you've preferentially removed the uh, lithospheric mantle perhaps through infiltration of melt from the bottom. Now that said, I've just argued, I've just spent this whole time arguing that this is all about thermal variations, and we really need very little melt. And indeed, the geochemistry indicates the potential temperatures here are low. I mean, I, I said 1300, but maybe 1250 uh, would be consistent with the, the geochemistry. So, um, and we don't see a lot of melt at the surface. We have volcanism, but it's volumetrically not particularly significant. So it's not clear that we have huge amounts of melt within this rift, unlike maybe somewhere like Ethiopia. So how exactly you are, um, you're breaking away the lithosphere from the bottom while still keeping uh, such relatively thick crust is uh, a bit of a mystery, um, but it's, it's an exciting one. Um, so a couple of the takeaways so far are that it looks like the mantle organizes itself 
significantly ahead of seafloor spreading and before, like I said, just before um, the crust has been thoroughly removed. Um, and we have seen that there is a structure in the mantle that's a candidate for um, the ultra-high pressure rocks that we observe at the surface, but um, nothing in this study is, has uh, definitively pinned down um, mechanisms for the exhumation. So what we wanted to do next was see if any of our results could be enhanced um, by relaxing the assumption which we've hitherto made, which people always make, which is that um, velocities are um, isotropic and include anisotropy, particularly in our shear velocity inversion. And the reason that we were motivated to do this was a shear rate splitting study that showed that there was really strong anisotropy within this rift up to a few um, up to units of percent. Um, anisotropy, for those in the room unfamiliar, is uh, an intrinsic property of uh, a medium, in this case, a medium that sustains uh, seismic waves, such that um, waves propagating through it in different directions uh, travel at different velocities. And um, this, is off, this is brought about classically in the mantle uh, as resulting from the preferential alignment of individual olivine crystals which are uh, individual crystals have this orthorhombic symmetry and are intrinsically anisotropic. If they are jumbled up um, with no preferential alignment in bulk, then seismic waves going through them will see an isotropic medium. But if they're preferentially aligned in a crystallographic preferred orientation, then the bulk property of the medium will be anisotropic. Another way that you can get anisotropy is a shape preferred orientation, such as that brought about by aligned melt lenses. And the reason, of course, these are two interesting things. Uh, this tells us something about the stress fields and the presence of melt, and CPO uh, is, um, is sort of integrated uh, strain, tells us about integrated strain through time as uh, strain produces a deformation fabric. So both of these are dynamically interesting, and we observe those um, as, um, we observe those in seismic waves, um, whereby the seismic waves will have uh, some preferential direction along, the, along which they will travel more rapidly. And that direction will uh, has dynamical implications as the direction of shear, if you're thinking about a crystallographic preferred orientation, or a direction of alignment and therefore perpendicular to uh, minimum stress for a shape preferred orientation. So we see anisotropy in rifts. Right? This is an image from the main Ethiopian rift where shear wave splitting shows these fast directions uh, aligned along the axis of the rifting um, and in the same location as the lowest P wave velocity anomalies. Um, and this is thought to be brought about by those aligned melt pockets, um, aligning obviously parallel to the direction of the rift and perpendicular to extension. Uh, in the Rio Grande rift, something similar is seen, whereby, um, for you know, you can see around it, the shear wave splitting studies show uh, directions parallel to plate motion, but within or actually kind of adjacent to the rift itself, um, the fast directions rotate around and also look parallel to the trend of the rift. So this is, and this, a similar thing is seen in Baikal and other rifts worldwide, <coughs> whereby the pattern is that these directions are parallel to the trend of the rift. Conversely, if we look at mid-ocean ridges, the uh, pattern of anisotropy is such that essentially all the way up to the ridge axis, um, the fast direction of anisotropy is aligned parallel to spreading. Now, it's true that in this study that they did see a few um, fast directions that were at a more uh, oblique angle to the spreading direction, but A, these have very large um, uncertainties, and B, they're from a slightly different method. Um, but most observations, including those of the East Pacific Rise, show that up to the ridge axis itself, the fast direction of anisotropy is parallel to the spreading. Now, that's kind of predicted by these uh, dynamical models that have evolving fabrics within them. So, so it's going to be interesting in our particular region where we're somewhere between a rift and a, and a mid-ocean ridge to see which one it looks like. Um, the other important point which I want to make is that anisotropy can bias isotropic tomography. Anisotropy um, can introduce velocity, uh, time delays of a comparable order to those introduced by, by isotropic velocity variations. Uh, and you will map those time delays into your um, isotropic uh, velocity model unless you're very careful. 
So for example, this is just a slide uh, from a talk a couple of years ago by Manuela Pichenda, where first they, they took a, a synthetic structure where they had uh, a slab going down into the mantle with isotropic velocities. They predicted, um, they predicted data and they inverted those again to get, um, to get uh, a model and so that this is what they, they got the first time. They did the same thing, um, permitting only isotropic VP variations, and you can see that they get something, sorry, in the forward model, per per permitting only isotropic VP variations, and you see they got something similar back. They did the same thing, thing again, but they included the effect of anisotropy in the forward model, and then they attempted to invert it again, assuming the whole thing was isotropic. And what they get was, um, what they saw was you have these enormous um, artifacts that are that have nothing to do with the isotropic velocities. This is purely the effect of anisotropy changing the travel times and mapping those back into an isotropic model, which of course is completely spurious. So this is a this is a kind of um, a cautionary tale that in regions of strong um, seismic anisotropy, doing sort of naive isotropic tomography versions can um, can put you in trouble. So several authors in the past have attempted um, anisotropic inversions. Uh, this is a very well-known study by David Abt and others where they used um, they used data from um, from earthquakes in the slab and uh, recorded them in their array in Nicaragua and they were able to uh, parameterize the anisotropy in terms of um, in terms of fabrics of olivine that they uh, mixed up and, and orthopyroxene that they mixed up in various proportions and aligned and they were able to uh, try and get at um, get at azimuthal anisotropy in the mantle wedge. This is a uh, study from uh, from China where they tried to invert uh, shear wave splitting measurements um, and uh, and you can see that the so the, the blue is the shear wave splitting and then the, the black is the, uh, is the model, and the red is supposed to be the regions where they uh, agree with each other, and there's not much red here, right? So this, they found, was a very difficult thing to do. And here's a, a, a P-wave anisotropy model where they're just comparing vertical velocities to horizontal velocities, um, and, and they, they sort of do an excellent job, but the, um, one of the features of this is that they found that they weren't able to do this with shear waves. Uh, things get much more complicated when you move from P to S. So, but that's what I want to do. Um, so, as I mentioned, we have these intrinsically anisotropic olivine crystals with orthorhombic symmetry, which um, requires one to know nine separate parameters, um, which we're not going to be able to do. So we're going to make the common assumption that people do, that the symmetry is hexagonal, requiring these five independent um, love parameters. Uh, that describe the elasticity. And then, of course, you need a couple more parameters, even having made this simplifying assumption, because you don't know which way this hexagonal symmetric thing is pointing, right? So you need a dip uh, angle, and you need a, a, um, a fast direction. So you get seven parameters per node if you're attempting to do this, uh, this inversion. And that doesn't include accounting for um, shear waves, splitting velocity, and, and the polarization, which you also don't know. So this is a pretty sticky problem. Um, I'm going to simplify <coughs> it quite a lot further. And the technique that we're going to do, so as I said, we're going to assume that it has hexagonal symmetry. We're also going to assume that the symmetry axis is horizontal. And then finally, within this rift, we're going to make the assumption that the structure is aligned north, south, or east, west. Right, we're going to exploit the natural geometry of this rifting system, which is a roughly east-west rift. Um, and we're going to justify this by appealing to the shear wave splitting results, which showed a predominantly north-south fast axis. So, we'll, so we're going to fix the, the symmetry axis to be north-south. And this will permit um, north-south fast or east-west fast, but nothing in between. Right? So anything truly in between will be mapped onto those two, onto that orthogonal basis. And we just sort of have to make that assumption in order to make this remotely tractable. But once we've done that, we get to this nice position where the the two velocities seen by, a shear, seen by a split shear wave, VSH and VSV, are a function only of uh, this angle, which is the angle of propagation from the, uh, the symmetry direction 
of this um, of the medium, and we derive analytic expressions which describe these two values purely in terms of this angle and two velocities that describe the medium, the perpendicular velocity and the parallel velocity, right? And those are just related to the average velocity of the medium and the value of anisotropy, right? So the two things I want to know about the medium are what's the uh, isotropic velocity and how strong is the anisotropy. And from those two, I go to um, a parallel velocity and a perpendicular velocity, and then I have some expressions which relate the two actual velocities seen by a shear wave to those values and this, ang and this angle. Um, and so when we plug the, um, these expressions into uh, the Christoffel equations, which is just what you get when you combine the equations of motion with Hooke's law using um, an anisotropic uh, crystallographic tensor, we get these uh, solid lines, and then I make a slight um, approximation to the expressions that make them um, analytically differentiable, and that approximation gives you the dotted lines, right? So what I've just come up with is um, a way of parameterizing the crystallographic fabric of this medium in terms of just two numbers, and the way I get away with that is you assume uh, equal PNS anisotropy, I'll assume some VPVS ratio, which is probably fine, and for the aficionado, I'll assume that eta is 1. So having done that, I have these two numbers, which are the things I really want to know, which are the, the um, isotropic velocity and the magnitude of azimuthal anisotropy. And I go from those to the velocities seen by any shear wave interrogating this structure at any angle. Uh, and, that's given, and that's given here. And you can say, well, you know, so you've kind of dreamt up this, this uh, way of doing it. Does it correspond to real rocks? Well. So this is just an example, um, but for, for this particular um, isotropic velocity and a particular amount of uh, anisotropy, I think there's something like 4% between these two, between VSV and VSH, you c it compares, compares very favorable, favorably to natural samples of peridotite or olivine. Um, so the fact that we've kind of rather artificially come up with constraints that link different parts of this crystallographic tensor together um, is, is reasonable because we're still coming up with results that look like what you get if you propagate these waves through real rocks right, that we know about and we've measured in the lab. Okay? And the upshot of all of this is we're able to uh, relate these two velocities, this VSH and VSV, to the two values that we want to know, the, value, the magnitude of anisotropy and the average velocity. And the really key thing is that because we've also fixed the uh, direction of the symmetry axis, those two velocities is VSH and VS, sorry, VSV and VSH are aligned almost exactly with um, north and with east. Right? So um, when we go to our seismometers and we measure a shear wave arrival on the north-south component, that north-south uh, arrival will have traveled with a velocity that is, lies along this curve, you know, depending on uh, the angle that it comes up at, right, which depends on the back azimuth and the incidence angle. And the arrival on our east component uh, lies somewhere along that curve. And by the way, just this is the data range. So you can see that for this range, we're also in the place where the approximation is very good. Um, the arrival on the east component um, is related very simply to um, the, the oh, horizontal, the VSH velocity that's again a function of just these two numbers. So it's a little complicated, but what we're able to do is relate arrivals on our seismometer components to these two key values, the isotropic velocity and the magnitude of azimuthal anisotropy. So what we do is we look at the arrivals, uh, shear wave arrivals on our seismometer components. We measure their polarization. If they're polarized north-south, then we say, so these have experienced essentially only north-south, um, only the part that's sensitive to north-south velocities, and we cross-correlate those between stations. If they are polarized east-west, we say they've experienced the, veloc the um, velocity relevant to only the east-west velocities, and we cross-correlate those between stations. If they're intermediate, then what's happened is that you've had an arrival which is presumably split onto the north-south and east-west components. We cross-correlate all the north-south uh, arrival times and all the east-west arrival times. And we can also cross-correlate for 
a given seismometer, the arrival on the north-south component with the arrival on the east-west component, because those two should be related to each other just by the, two, the relative velocities having come up as one thing then being split into two. Right, so this is kind of the definition of shear wave splitting. Um, and we, so we relate these, uh, these three sets of cross correlations together because they are dictated by, um, by only two sets of data, the, the arrival time on the north component and the arrival time on the east component. So we kind of have, have manufactured more data um, by doing north-south cross correlation, east-west correla cross correlation, and north versus east cross correlation. Um, and so this is just an example of that. So you can see these uh, arrivals across the array at different stations recorded on the north component, and they're of course um, not quite uh, aligned because we haven't corrected them yet. The same thing on the east-west component, and then comparing the north versus the west. And you can see here that the north-south time, the north-south arrivals are slightly earlier than the east-west arrivals, implying north fast and isotropy, right? So we do this three-way cross-correlation where we cross-correlate these, cross-correlate these, and these, and it invert them in one step. And you can see that it allows us to realign all the arrivals on the norths, to realign all the alignments on the west, and to realign the north versus west. Um, so these arrival times, uh, through the um, mathematical structure that I described earlier, allow us to provide the foundation of an, uh, an inversion, whereby we simultaneously invert for velocity and anisotropy. And just a reminder that the anisotropy we're getting is, only, is fixed to the north, south, or east, west. So for all these plots, um, blue colors indicate north faster than east, and red colors indicate east faster than north. Right? And that's just a difference between a positive anisotropy and a negative anisotropy. If you think about that, um, that indicatrix um, figure that I showed, the, that the oblate spheroid, that's just the difference between whether it's oblate or prolate. Right? So you can just kind of stretch that thing uh, but the maths stays the same. Um, so here I just show um, some checkerboard tests that demonstrate that we are able to resolve, to recover uh, input structure. Um, and you can see also that we're able to independently recover velocity and anisotropy structure. If you look kind of carefully, you can see that the anisotropy checkers are offset from the velocity checkers, uh, and we're still able to get the, the structure. So it's not just sort of one mapping into the other. We're truly able to resolve the two different parameters in the same step. So first of all, um, so I guess I'll be candid, the, it's, a, it's a messy inversion that requires lots of regularization because the data are, are messy and there aren't that many of them. So the first thing we do is just try and get the minimum out of what, of what this data set is telling us. And we do an inversion that is restricted to 2D along the rift. Right, so this is, these are just going to be uh, 2D uh, slices perpendicular uh, to the rift, um, and we perform this in, this independent inversion for isotropic velocity always on the left, and in the jet colors, and then anisotropy on the right. And you can see that just like in the isotropic tomography, we re we recover this low velocity rift axis, and the colors are a little washed out on the screen up here. But we also see this uh, high velocity region to the north that contains the intermediate depth. Earthquakes. So they're great. This is like a lot like what the isotropic tomography on its own is telling us. But um, the extra step we've taken here is recovering the azimuthal anisotropy. And what we're seeing here is there's this region in the center of the rift which has north fast anisotropy. Right? That's what the blue colors that mean. And at the, the margins of the rift, we have this east-west fast anisotropy. And just to sort of help guide your eye, uh, I'll put these kind of cartoonish things over. And so these arrows are uh, telling you the, the north, showing you the north-south uh, fast regions, and the sort of arrows into the board telling you the east-west fast regions. And here I've also overlaid this um, kind of shaded region, which um, demarcates the uh, the lowest velocities. And then I've kind of flipped them so they're both on both images. So you can really clearly see that the region of low velocities at the heart of the rift, right, which directly underlies the the Dontrocasto Islands, where we had all the volcanism, and directly underlie the area where you have the, the thinnest crust, is also this region where you have this marked uh, spreading parallel anisotropy breaking upwards into the heart of the rift. And what it seems to have done is shoved aside this east-west anisotropic region, which now lies on the rift um, on the rift shoulders. And our interpretation of this is that you had some pre-existing lithospheric fabric 
that happen to be east-west, which makes sense because that's also um, along, um, along the trend line of lots of recent orogenies in this region. And we know that orogenic belts often have uh, belts parallel and isotropy. So you have this pre-existing east-west structure that has been broken up as, uh, as the lithosphere has broken up and as the asthenosphere has upwelled into the region, carrying with it and simultaneously accruing a spreading parallel isotropic signature. Um, and this is kind of exciting. It seems like we can see the process of lithospheric breakup in the, in the signature uh, of the anisotropy. So of course, we also make a 3D model. Um, and it shows uh, you know, largely the same thing. So again, this is the isotropic velocity component of the model. Um, and uh, you can see this east-west swath of, of slow velocities and the fast region in the north, as we're now kind of used to. Um, and when we compare this anisotropic um, inversion for just the shear velocity with the isotropic one with a velocity model from radio waves, you can see they compare very favorably. One really nice thing um, is that in the southern region of this rift, whereas before when we had the isotropic um, velocities, we didn't really see a southern margin. We, we see a southern margin much better having accounted for the anisotropy. And that's actually just due to this funny coincidence that this region down here happen to be primarily illuminated by um, rays that were polarized north-south. And so they were going through this anisotropic region that was east-west, now it's canceling them out. Right? So it's canceling out the fact that it was uh, faster with the fact that it was anisotropically slower. So we didn't see a region down here. Having accounted for the anisotropy correctly, we recover both rift shoulders quite well. Now, of course, the, in the north, things are even even faster still because of the, uh, the lithospheric fra fragment. But um, it's just sort of a nice feature that proves that accounting correctly for the anisotropy within your inversion can even improve your isotropic velocity model. Uh, so this is what the anisotropy model looks like. Again, the blue means north-south fast, so fast in the uh, parallel to the direction of uh, north-south extension. And you can see that just as we kind of inferred from the, from the 2D slices, um, there's this swath along uh, the axis of the rift, which has anisotropy parallel to the spreading direction. Um, other things to point out are that, on, like I said, on both flanks, um, you have east-west fast um, anisotropy, particularly this region in the north, kind of affiliated with, the, with where we had that lithospheric fragment. I'll go into that in a sec. Um, but overall, um, particularly in the shallow parts of the model, the, uh, the area seems to be dominated by spreading parallel uh, anisotropy. And this is kind of what we expected from the Shoei splitting site. So what I then did was take this model and the isotropic um, velocity part that goes with it and propagate through it um, synthetic shear waves. And every sort of five, for five kilometer increments, you uh, compute the, the correct um, anisotropic crystallographic tensor, put it through the whole, put through the Christoffel equations, do the artificial splitting, move on to the next five kilometer increment, until you have at the, at the surface recorded your station some artificially split shear wave. And we then um, invert that shear wave using sort of Silver and Chan uh, minimum energy method that is traditional for uh, shear wave splitting. Uh, and we get, these, um, we get these red bars. And we compare that to the data, which were uh, which we recorded from um, SKS um, arrivals from um, between sort of 90 and 130 uh, degrees away uh, from, uh, from real earthquakes, and those are the blue bars. And we compare the two, and um, I'm not too worried about the, I, I don't worry here too much about the magnitude of the anisotropy, we can talk about that, but uh, first of all, we just try and compare whether the directions of splitting, the directions of the fast axis, that we infer are the same, and so at the center of these, um, the center of these little icons, I've got a, a circle with a color in it, and the colors are we have good alignment of the two fast axes. If it's green, you can see across this array, the colors are pretty much all green. There's a bit of disagreement up here, um, but predominantly, um, this model of anisotropy um, produces synthetic shear wave splitting, which is which is incredibly uh, closely consistent with the observations of shear wave splitting. And I'll just uh, emphasize that these SKS um, observations were not included in the inversion. Right? So this is kind of a, an independent confirmation 
that the anisotropic model which we've recovered is really pretty robust and it agrees with other observations. So that, that was really nice to see. So I guess I'm running a little short on time, but um, quickly just looking at a couple of the cross sections uh, through first the isotropic velocity model, you can see, as we've seen before, that there is this um, low velocity rift axis juxtaposed against this high velocity feature. As we step um, eastwards, the low velocities get a little bit broader, maybe a little bit shallower, and the high velocity feature dies out. If we look at the anisotropy, as we saw with it, with the, just the 2D inversion, there's this uh, region directly beneath the rift axis that has, uh, has north-south fast anisotropy juxtaposed against a region with east-west anisotropy. And if I just sort of put a couple of cartoonish arrows and things up on here to help guide your eye, you can see that within the um, within the sort of axis of the rift, we have this region here where, where I'm arguing that you have this fabric breaking upwards, um, driving apart the pre-existing fabric. But there's this kind of particular region in the north where you have much stronger east-west fabric, um, and that's you know directly um, where in other in previous images we've seen this lithospheric fragment. If I then put on the um, kind of overlay these those arrows back onto the velocity images, you can see that. Again, in the region in the center, where we have the lowest velocities, we have this spreading uh, parallel fabric breaking upwards into the, um, as the lithosphere, as the lithosphere breaks apart and the asthenosphere upwells. But in the north here, in this region where we have the lithospheric, we have some sort of slab fragment, something like that, that's actually where the east-west anisotropy is strongest. And this is something we kind of maybe expect. There could be a few reasons for this. It could be flow around the edges of this. Um, of this, this lithospheric fragment. Uh, it could be the intrinsic structure of the lithospheric fragment. Uh, there's a recent study by Caroline Eakin in South America where she, where she shows that within the downgoing slab itself, there is slab uh, parallel, which is in this case is east-west anisotropy. So that could be some of what we're seeing here. Um, perhaps we don't need to kind of commit ourselves to a particular mechanism because it's just observed in many uh, subduction zones worldwide that there is um, subduction zone parallel fast axis. So, you know, I guess this is a this could be argued for uh, to be an, another example of that sort of thing. But the main um, the main conclusion that we draw is that within the heart of this rift, where you've had the lithosphere break up and the asthenosphere up well, you've generated um, a spreading parallel fabric, which is not like what we see in other rifts, right? So in other rifts, like I said at the beginning, you see predominantly rift parallel fast axes, right? And that could be due to aligned melt pockets, it could be due to uh, a long rift flow, which is invoked in the main Ethiopian rift as resulting from the influence of the plume. <coughs> um, workers in the woodlock rift has, have argued that there might be a long rift flow as well, uh, caused by upwelling of some felsic uh, body that then gives rise to the ultra high pressure rocks. Um, but both of these would, pr would um, predict the anisotropy we should see within the rift will be parallel to the rift, which is exactly the opposite of what we do see. What we do see is the anisotropy within the rift is parallel to the spreading, which is um, predicted for some people's models of how continental rifts um, should form, and is certainly predicted for lots of models of mid-ocean ridges. So we're kind of arguing that um, what our data is showing is that a spreading parallel crystallographic fabric is established relatively efficiently and shallowly within the axis of rifts, um, provided sufficient extension, and maybe provided something else. So um, this was sort of what we learned from the isotropic tomography. We have thin lithosphere, thin lithospheric mantle, um, somewhat thin but not nearly as thin crust. We have this uh, relatively localized, low velocity body um, rift axis beneath the um, beneath the thin crust and beneath the Dontrocasto Islands and their volcanism, and we have this lithospheric fragment in the north. We've added to that by doing this anisotropic tomography, which shows that on the rift margins, we have um, east-west fabric, and within the rift, um, shallowly, within the rift axis itself, we see this spreading parallel um, anisotropy. And one of the things that this could imply is that... Um, is that there is not uh, the the dominant flow, the dominant strain in this region, 
is not vertical, as we might expect for sort of vertical flow of a sphenosphere up within a rift axis, but seems to be more horizontal. Um, and or this might require, given that you know we do expect some input, input of fluids and things, is that there is some shallow layer within this rift axis, and this has been suggested in other rifts as a means to stabilize, um, stabilize shallow rifting, um, that there is some depleted and dehydrated layer within the rift axis um, that where you know the um, the iron has been lost through melting, the water has been lost through melting, so you have this buoyant and high viscosity region within the shallow rift, which then is not easily able to sustain vertical flows, but will thin mainly by horizontal shearing. And that's what's um, producing the predominantly horizontal um, fabric. Um, so I think we have um, improved upon the simple isotropic tomography. We have this new parameterization, which um, I can explain maybe more convincingly afterwards, uh, and uh, new means of doing this data collection, including a couple of assumptions, but we think they're very robust assumptions, um, and that gives us this tractable, tractable inverse problem that allows us to jointly invert for anisotropy and velocity heterogeneities. And it's sort of bolstered by the confirmation from the Shirley splitting predictions, which agreed very well with Shirley splitting observations. And what we're seeing is that um, in low, perhaps in low strain rifts, like the main Ethiopian rift and a couple of others, maybe that's where a line melt uh, will dominate the uh, anisotropy. Whereas within a high strain rift like this one, or a mid-ocean ridge, um, an shallow anisotropy might be dominated by a crystallographic fabric parallel to spreading. It's kind of what we're arguing for. Uh, which implies that um, this fabric is established quite efficiently um, along with extension, uplifting, and thinning. Uh, so I'll kind of leave these takeaways up on the board uh, and take any questions you have. Questions? Rick, what's the force that's both driving that lithospheric wedge down and then back up to get the ultra high pressure? <laughs> um, that a, I mean, you showed it sort of as a remnant of a subduction zone. But yeah. So. Uh, uh, so there's this recent. Uh, you see that? Yeah. So. Right. Oh, it's um, several models being proposed. The two sort of end members are diaporism and um, eduction. Um, both of them have problems. Um, the diaporism, um, they, the people that advocate for that sort of put this low um, density blob of continental derived material. They don't really describe how it gets down there, but then they infer that it, it just uh, unstably, um, unstably uh, sort of percolates, but comes as a radiator stability and, and uh, upwells uh, gravitationally. Uh, and then they kind of appeal to a very high density ultramafic belt, in, which is seen elsewhere in this region, to get to provide uh, sufficient buoyancy, relative buoyancy of that maf of that felsic material to get it through the crust. And so they have these uh, uh, diaperically upwelling through um, really quickly. Um, eduction, people kind of want the reversal along sub some subduction zone. This is a, um, a really interesting study by um, Kenny Peterson and Roger Buck, where they have. Um, Australian lithosphere going down, um, which be, uh, the, and the subduction initiates as a as slab going down and carries with it some continental um, crust, and then at some point this uh, a necking uh, happens and you drop away your lithospheric anchor, and then uh, buoyantly this thing kind of simultaneously rolls back and uh, pushes material up the. Um, the, the uh, kind of delamination zone above the slab, and that's how it really quickly comes back up to the surface by by buoyancy having dropped off a dense root. Um, so these, those are kind of the two end members. Um, this kind of model doesn't really make sense with the with the geology that you see along strike. So while it looks really nice in 2D and agrees with lots of the observations in 2D, it's unclear where it goes 100 kilometers west or 100 kilometers east. Um, but it's but given the fact that we see um, 
a lithospheric fragment, a long strike from the place where you see these really high pressure metamorphic rocks, you know, maybe means that there is this kind of process that can happen in segments along strikes, something like that. That answers your question. Can you give you enough strain to produce a CPR? Mm -hmm. Do you have enough strain to produce a lot of heat? Do you ever calculate the thing? No, no. Um, Do you know what the stress is in the strain class? So the strain to get a um, So you can calculate, uh, this is a little fun thing that I did once. Um, if we just assume very little about the whole system and you say that there is some extension, some strain at the top of it and that's accommodated over a given depth, you get a shear strain out of that. And then you can go to the literature values that connect strain to the establishment of a, um, a fabric strength, which is quantified by this J index. And then um, you go look at your uh, suite of samples and you, and you look at how does the fabric relate to the sample anisotropy uh, and so that so through this you can relate the amount of strain to the amount of anisotropy and then because so you know this extension and you know this depth so for, so for various values of extension and various depths of which it's accommodated you get the strain you get the fabric you get the anisotropy and so you get these values of anisotropy with increasing extension but then the nice thing is that um, the depth over which you've actually accommodated um, the, the extension um, relates positively to the amount of fabric that you get, but negatively to the, the um, anisotropic region through which any seismic wave will have to travel. Right? So there's this kind of perfect trade-off between them, and you find that when you actually compute the amount of splitting time accrued by a seismic wave traveling through that sheared region, um, it all collapses to a common line. And so you can actually go straight from the amount of extension at the surface to the amount of splitting time you expect for like a roughly vertically propagating uh, shear wave. Now, the, yeah, I didn't. So, I mean, what I guess answers your question is, is this half of the plot, which relates the amount of strain to the to quantify, to sort of seismically meaningful anisotropies. So you're looking at a strain of about 100 to 150%. Now, new um, uh, experiments done on previous, so this is assuming there is no previous fabric in there, right, but Lars Hansen and others have these bunch of experiments that shows if you do have a previous fabric, then the amount of strain that it requires to undo that fabric and reorientate it into a new direction is really pretty substantial. So this ignores all of that. Um, but yeah, strains on the order of 100% are what you're looking at. Good. So, so that is the, uh, the Solomon Sea is up there, and that Trobriand Trough that I referred to at the very beginning. <coughs> now, Jeff, my advisor, actually hates this image because <laughs> because he he would very much, for uh, uh, other reasons, like this to dip the other way. And it's very true that in our uh, tomography, uh, I'll go to sort of the best result tomography, which is the P wave tomography, way back. We do not have, here we go, well, you can kind of see it there, but let me get rid of it. We do not have good dip constraints, right? So like, I mean, you could actually argue there's a slight northward dip, but it's, there's nothing in it. And you can see from the seismicity, there's no, clearly Benioff, there's no clear Benioff zone that delineates a dip direction uh, in, either dire in you know, either way. Mm -hmm. um, I, think it makes, I think it makes most sense to have southward subduction at that Trobrian trough, because Partly because we have very little, in a way, of constraints 
on the Solomon Sea plate that lies off to the north of here. And that's because it's entirely underwater. Um, the other candidate for subduction was northward subduction of Australian plates beneath what would have here been some proto arc that was then uh, broken up by this rifting. The problem there is that um, the most recent that you could have had subduction is in the Eocene. Because since then, you had the opening of the Coral Sea just to the south of here. And we have magnetic anomalies in the Coral Sea, and they're perfectly symmetric, right? So you couldn't have got rid of any material, because we see both sides of that opening. Um, so, the, so the most recent that subduction could have been is in the Eocene. And then the question is, so if it was Eocene subduction that gave rise to those high-pressure rocks, could they have stayed around at those temperatures for long enough to five million years ago have been really quite cold compared to how much you might have expected them to warm up? Um, so that's why I kind of prefer uh, southward subduction, because there's nothing saying we couldn't do it. The, the problem with that is where did you derive, like we have no constraints on any continental bodies that have come from the north. Right, so... Do you know anything about the fabric of that oceanic plate before it's about? Uh The Solomon Sea in the north? No, almost very little. Do you know anything Um, so where did that work? So, so normally when an when oceanic plate forms, the yeah. coherent fabric is spreading parallel. Sure. Okay, that's what you're getting at. Right. I see. So if it was spreading parallel this way, then it's rotated 180 degrees once it's subducted, which is true, we seen in South America, but under like very, very um, I have, conditions. I, so I believe magnetic anomalies in the Solomon Sea are not well resolved. I think they are pretty messy. And so yeah, so we don't know whether this thing has a through going fabric like this or like this, okay. um, which I which I see is what you're getting at. Um, yeah, okay. so I don't know, but that's that's a really that's interesting nice. question. Yeah. <laughs> so well, now we know. Eh? So sure. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So because of the fact that we're using only uh, S-waves, we have really very low sensitivity to P-wave anisotropy and to the VPVS ratio, obviously. That's like a tiny, it barely matters at all. Um, That's where you just pick the value for it. Exactly, yeah. And we actually tested different values and showed, A, that the velocities would vary so little between those values, even if they varied um, among the array, and B, how much they would vary if we just picked different values for the entire uh, model. Um, so yeah, that's, it's not sensitive to that. The thing it could be sensitive to, which is what... Um, the biggest weakness of this is the possible insensitivity to dip. right? And I spent a while arguing that there's this horizontal fabric, and this is telling us something about um, the uh, maybe the viscosity of the, of the shallow part of the rift wall, mainly accommodating horizontal strain. Well, a question you could very well ask is, you're, you've assumed that the anisotropy here is horizontal. Right? What would happen if it were actually um, dipping at something other than uh, the horizontal? And so, A, what would happen is that we would map, uh, we would essentially project um, the, the true maximum anisotropy downwards into the horizontal plane. That's almost exactly what would happen. Um, because we have pretty good back azimuthal constraints, if you were looking at just one back azimuth, then you could get into real trouble because if you were looking, happen to be looking along the dip direction, then you, anyway. Um, so, so the dip is is really key, but there are um, a bunch of uh, other places where people have constrained the dip using P waves, which is a lot easier to do than using S waves, and seen that um, generally a horizontal assumption is not bad. And the other thing is that if this were steeply dipping. And then, and what we are seeing is just the horizontal projection of that. It would require enormous intrinsic anisotropy, which is like more than anyone's ever seen anywhere else. So we're kind of um, happy to say that um, the values we're getting are small and reasonable enough that they are also physical, and therefore it, it really does look like it's horizontal. Um, we, yeah, we try. Want and, people in the back to hear you. Oh, so uh, the question was whether um, you're using surface waves to look for radial anisotropy here. 
um, the answer is that they have tried and um, the answer is really no because the array aperture is not really big enough to get good constraints on it. We're sort of 250 kilometers across and um, it's, yeah, it gets messy. That's what the surface wave people tell me. Last question for Brad. All right, so you can't actually understand, but I was surprised that the uh, reasonable range for a rectangle parallel is parallel to the Well, that was uh, that reasoning was more to do with um, the way that it's getting that it we see it so shallowly. Um, but you're right that if I go to so here, so you're right that right down here um, we have this deep extent of um, of spreading parallel and isotropy. So what I was saying before was just that maybe up here the reason that you have predominantly horizontal strain is because you've um, depleted the region through melt, and so it's buoyant and high viscosity, and so it's so it's not really upwelling and downwelling much. It's mainly experiencing horizontal strain. This down here, I think, is a combination uh, of two things. It could be due to dragging a um, this lithospheric fragment through, um, you know, 150 kilometers of mantle, and that might produce horizontal shear kind of beneath it. Um, the other thing to say is that squeezing tests on this inversion show that we really only constrain any of these anomalies down to it's actually 170 kilometers depth. Right? So that doesn't mean that these couldn't be here. It means that uh, this is sort of the preferred model, whereby we don't force all of this anisotropy more uh, shallow than this depth, which would just make this stuff much bluer. So there's a bit of a trade-off between those two, but we can't robustly say that this isn't much or somewhat stronger and I thought to be this actually shallow, which would kind of make a bit more sense with a uh, corner flow model. The other thing is that, and it, it's like a, um, it's very difficult to get your head around and like whenever I think about it, it makes my head hurt, but the, um, the riff is um, moving in an absolute reference frame, so, the, uh, so it's moving north at about 50 millimeters per year. So the actual source region for, if you kind of think about the flow lines, the source region for material that upwells right at the rift axis is actually kind of over here, right? So you have, what's happening is that it's, it's flowing up very asymmetrically. And the asymmetric flow could mean that at depth you have a large component of horizontal flow, sort of essentially southward flow, which gives rise to um, spreading mm -hmm. so extension parallel um, fast axes at depth. And that's been suggested for the uh, East Pacific Rise, where they see a very similar thing. Um, and so, you know, those are a couple of ideas to throw out. But yeah, it it also, you know, it would have been nicer if it didn't turn up. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all, and thanks, Zach. Thanks very much.